In this episode of Mind Pump, we answer questions asked by listeners like you. What they do is they go to our Instagram page, Mind Pump Media. They post the question. We pick the best ones, and then we have a lot of fun answering them. Only the best ones. Now, in the introductory portion of this episode, we talk about current events and whatever we feel like talking about, and you'll realize that when you listen to <laughs> this episode. So we start out by talking about ADD. Yep, we probably have it. What does that mean? I don't know. Uh, we talked about the movie Jojo Rabbit. We think that's going to win major Excellent movie. awards. Super good movie. Uh, we talked about how Apple, uh, there's a bunch of plugs of uh, in the morning show, which is a show on Apple+. Plus. I have yet to watch it because I'm not paying for one more service. Yeah, stick it to the man. Then I talked about how I need an intervention because uh, I'm getting... Uh, fatty cakes all over my body. <laughs> I love it, Sal. We talked about how Dr. Dre is going to be working with Kanye on the next Dre Jesus is and Kanye. Isn't that crazy? Working yeah, on the next Jesus is King album. That's going to be massive. It's going to be awesome. I talked about pine bark extract, which contains pycnogenol. It's got some interesting properties. It's one of the ingredients in the brand new Organifi supplement. Move. This is a joint support anti-inflammatory supplement. Um, the ingredients are quite compelling. I'm taking it right now. I'll give everybody feedback on how I like it. Anyhow, Organifi is the maker of vegan supplements like protein powders, green juices, gold juices, red juices, and the product I talked about, Move, which is for your joints. We have a discount for you. If you go to Organifi.com forward slash mind pump and use the code mind pump, you'll get 20 percent off. Um, and uh, between November 20th and 27th, buy three of any products and get a free glass bottle. That's a new promotion. Peter Pack and Pick of Picnogenals. Then I talked about the ketogenic diet and how it may actually help your body fight off the flu. Kind of cool. Yeah. I talked about almond history. I don't know if you guys knew this or not, <laughs> but uh, wild almonds can kill you. Apparently they have oh, fun fact. high amounts of cyanide. Now, Skinny Dipped does not use dangerous wild it almonds. It will not kill you. They use the kind that we grow for consumption that are very healthy for you. What they do is they coat them very lightly in chocolate so that the almonds still have awesome macronutrient profiles, low calories, low sugar. They kiss it with cocoa powder. But they're chocolate-covered almonds. They're so good. We have a discount for you. Go to skinnydipped.com forward slash mind pump. Enter the code mind pump and get 20% off. Then I talked about how diet can actually help prevent hearing loss. That's right. Study came out showing that a healthy diet may actually prevent that from happening. Then we talked about Airbnb and its Olympic sponsorship. Um, and then we got into answering the fitness questions. Yeah. Here's the first question. This person wants to know what a deload week looks like and what the value is of a deload week. Next question. This person wants to know how to develop their side butt. This is the part of the butt that's on the side. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of obvious. Right. These muscles are the uh, gluteus minimus and gluteus medius. So we talk that about profile butt. exercises for that. Next question. This person is hypermobile, meaning they have like lots and lots of flexibility. They've got pain. How do we address hypermobility through exercise? And the final question this person wants to know, who our most memorable clients were ever when we were personal trainers? Also, this month, MAPS Performance is 50% off. So MAPS Performance is a workout program that is all based around functional athletic-based exercises. So you are going to the gym, you are using weights, but you're doing different workouts, different exercises to build your body in different ways. You will build muscle, you will burn body fat, but you'll also improve your athletic ability, your functional mm -hmm. Athletic ability. Using those muscles, Sal. And Mass Performance is the only mass program with uh, mobility sessions. These are sessions designed specifically to improve your mobility. And again, it's 50% off. Here's how you get the program with the discount. Go to mapsgreen.com and use the code GREEN50, G-R-E-E-N-5-0, -E no space, for the discount. I think because... Uh, you know, we've talked about this before. I know, Sal, you went, were formally diagnosed, but I'm pretty sure I have ADD also. Uh, and I think that- I think that all entrepreneurs do. Probably, it's right? It's more common. Yeah. yeah. Among I mean, friends. for sure, like I'm somewhere on that side of the spectrum. And I think uh, authors that write, 
in short stories or excerpts like that, I do, I do really it has well. more impact. Yeah, because yeah, I can too. read it and then like oh, absorb it, think mm-hmm. about it. Like and then if you you take me on a long journey, sometimes it's uh, you, you yeah, probably get lost. You're yeah. like, what happened? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> get, a re- get the page back up. Yeah. Right. I think that should be your first sign if you potentially have it. Like, how often do you have to reread pages? Like, I'm oh, that guy for sure. Yeah. <laughs> constantly it's got to be a hard thing to really diagnose though because it's, it's just like a attention attention issues are so common mm-hmm. you know such a thing well that, what what i what i don't know or even care is like uh, whether it i formally have it or not i think that there's there's certain practices that you can do to get better about it and there's certain things that make it worse and i think that's the key is being aware and then putting in the work to try and improve it right or or use it to your advantage right people who have add or add type qualities if whatever you want to call symptoms they tend to be more often than not uh, entrepreneurs salespeople, um entertainers so there may be a a dual there may be one of those things where it's like a benefit but also detriment you know what i mean oh yeah and um i know it i don't know i you know, I don't want to. I don't want to categorize it too strongly because um, I'm, I'm sure some people really suffer from those types of symptoms. But for me, that you know, attention moving from one thing to the next served me really, really well uh, managing gyms. Well, it was like a, it was like a, it was like that's what you it's needed. Like a superpower, there. Yeah, yeah, you know. Well, you 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 hear me say on the show all the time that uh, I believe your your greatest strengths are your greatest weaknesses. Well, that works in reverse also. You know, your greatest weaknesses can be your greatest strengths too. So, you know, if one of your greatest weaknesses is you have a terrible attention span and you potentially have ADD, well, try and think of the things where that could serve you, you know, and, and jobs like the gym, I think why we all kind of fell in love and found that is like you are, you're a million things going at once and you can't get frustrated with that. Like you just embrace it, that you always got a, a, a bunch of stuff on your plate and you're you know, whatever multitasking, even though people don't like the term multitasking, but it's, I think something that you can learn to, to use to your benefit. They found, they, they, did you know that there's a, one of the characteristics is a hyper-focus of ADD? Yeah. 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 So, because twice I've had doctors tell me, oh, I I think you might have. And one of the first time the doctor told me that and I said, well, I don't think that's true. I said, when I really get into something like you cannot peel me away from it. Like you could fire a cannon off next to my head. And, <laughs> yep. You know, and she's like, yeah, that's exactly uh, one of the characteristics. Yeah. The, the hyper, the hyper focus or whatever. It's fun. Whatever. You're going to categorize it, do whatever you want. You yeah. know, I, I've, I've organized my life around it. You know what I'm saying? Like what, like I have a few strategies. Like yeah. I always put certain things in exactly the same place. My keys in my wallet. There's only two or three places that they'll ever be ever. <laughs> and I've learned to do that because yeah. I used to lose them all the time. I've also learned to work with or partner with people who are very organized. It just it just works well with me because I tend to be mm-hmm. so disorganized. Um, and so you know, again, you just organize your life around it, and it you know whatever works better. It's just all the ways of learning that's like super diverse. It's like everybody has a different preference and things that they're drawn towards. And so if you're more drawn towards like create like like eliminating chaos and creating stability through organization. And that's like your main thing. Then that's what you're going to be drawn towards. And that's how you're going to, you know, learn. And it's going to reflect that versus, yeah. you know, the opposite or the whole spectrum in between. Totally. Dude, uh, watched, uh, Jojo rabbit. Oh, yeah. I told you, it's, wasn't that a great movie for such a good movie? Really? I feel such, like it should be up for an Oscar. It that's will be how much I like. It. it has to be. Yeah. Wow. That good. It is. I mean, it looks funny. Don't get me wrong. Like it looks, but well, you, you that's are, yeah. That's it's not just funny. It's though. not just funny. That that's the thing. It's 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 so well like intelligently written, and and, and it, it really makes you feel something. You know, which you don't get a lot of times from movies. Like interesting, controversial at all. It's uh, it's everything. It's, maybe it's, it's a little it's, bit. It's funny. It's the it's social justice uh, done the right way because it takes you on a journey. It pokes fun at stuff that's hard for you to at first kind of be like, oh, am I really laughing at this? But then they do it in a way that uh, that you can laugh at it. But then it gets very serious. It pulls at your heartstrings. Well, it's uh, it's an emotional it, it humanizes uh, these these villains out. There. Everybody's so quick to call somebody a Nazi. Everybody's so quick to like try and figure like like find that that extreme of of 
you know, okay, so you, this is the, the most evil example I could come up with, right? Mm -hmm. But you have to realize there's still human beings and there's people that were in that situation that didn't want to be in that situation and were playing the part of Nazi, but also, you know, having like all this, 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 like, extra stuff that they were dealing with to try to cope with that. Yeah, it's 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 uh, such smart writing. The comedy was excellent. It's written so well that it, it challenges you. Wow, I'm um, excited to watch it now. Um, and again, it pulls at your heartstrings. I mean, there's a few few moments, there's Definitely. a few points in the movie where you're like, you're moved to, to yeah. emotion did or you, tears. Justin, did you start watching the the morning show that I talked I about? I did. did. You like that? I really like it. So I was, uh, somebody shared an article uh, from Wall Street Journal with me about... Um, the show and now that you now that you're watching it you'll have to because now they sh i read the article and now i can't help but like pay attention and count uh -huh. but uh on average uh apple is in 34 to 50 scenes in every episode like the branding yeah, in the yeah. background and everything yeah, yeah. what uh, yeah i didn't notice that. yeah yeah because it's an apple it's produced by apple oh, right yeah. so they and of wow. course i mean it's uh would <laughs> product placement everywhere huh? yeah no so after i read the article now i watched an episode uh the night before last yeah and you know i'm like oh shit now where do you guys find the show i looked for it the other day and i couldn't find it it's, it's on, on apple, apple plus apple plus. that's the only place yeah, yeah. yeah. oh man yeah. yeah no it damn i gotta get everything oh it's good dude it's <laughs> it's great i mean it's it's interesting how they've they've brought up you know the Me Too movement and all these examples of it's like it, it's a great insight into the like how uh, you know these these massive egos going into a, a, a newscast like how well you, you know, get, that dynamic works you get you get a, a sense and I I haven't actually read on this if they, it was uh, maybe you have Justin but I remember um, was it loudest voices Doug what's the other one that I, I turned you guys on to I know you watched it Doug. Oh, I, I don't recall. Oh, Russell yes. Crowe, right? Or yeah, the, the loudest voice, right? The loudest voice, right? That's what that one was called, and that one was all based on a true true events that happen mm -hmm. at, in Fox News. Mm. So now this is like a a more uh, liberal slight slanted uh, show mm -hmm. that similar type of issues were happening behind. Is this. it comedy though? No. Oh, this is a serious show. Yeah, yeah it's more drama. Oh, okay. Yeah, although okay. it has it has bits of humor in it, but it's a, it would be considered a drama. But you could, I feel like we're there. It's it, like Justin said, they're they're kind of wrapping in the Me Too that timing when that was all going on, and the, it's called the morning show, and the actors and actresses in it are phenomenal, and and I I, I like where it's going so far. I mean, I, I think four or five episodes mm. in, and it's. It's pretty. Damn, but I, I don't I, have to get into that. Yeah, it gives everybody's perspective on like how all these things kind of like come to like uh, the peak in terms of bad behavior and all that. Yeah. That's the only streaming service I don't have. Gosh, really? Yeah, I got everything already. <laughs> well, I got another one for you that I didn't know. I just keep adding because it's like screw cable. Yeah, yeah. I'll just keep adding all these extra canceled, little things. You dude. canceled cable a long right? time ago, yeah. dude. Like, <laughs> somebody, like two years ago. Somebody was. I saw like a meme that was floating around that the you know oh this is so brilliant all this stream that we're doing and then sooner or later someone's gonna. Uh, uh, evolve and put it all together and call it cable yeah, yeah. it's gonna be weird <laughs> yeah. real weird yeah, yeah. 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 that's yeah. hilarious it's like, <laughs> oh man yeah it's like reverse dude, engineer it dude yeah. I might need an intervention what's Why? going on fucking you want to know, you know what I ate for breakfast this morning what so I had uh, eight egg yolks I had a half a pound of ground beef uh, and then I had a bowl of cereal Wow, that look was at, my that was my breakfast. Look at you! I don't know Bol what's going on. Bolster. I don't know, man. Chasing cholesterol like crazy. I don't know what's happening. I think it's because the you know, remember I told you the weather as it gets colder, mm. I get a little sad. It's fluffy season. Yeah, yeah. dude. Ah, oh, I love it. It's the, my favorite time. I, I got to be careful with the fat cakes are starting to pile on a little oh, bit. Oh man, I embrace it. It's winter time. Put uh, your winter coat on. I put on, I put on look, my pants this you're morning. You're big and strong, dude. Yeah, you still look sexy, fluffy. Yeah, yeah fluffy, you know fluffy, sexy. <laughs> yeah. That's what Jessica says. Yeah, she's like, you don't look. She just what she tells me. You don't look any different. I'm like, babe, I'm approximately 18 pounds heavier. <laughs> it's impossible to look exactly the same. No, no, no you look the same. <laughs> no, I'm, conv I'm convinced <laughs> all of our girls like us a little bit. Which you yeah. know how funny is that though? Talking about like our insecurities and why we got into fitness and stuff like that to to look a certain way. And, you know, meanwhile, our wives are all like, Hey, uh, I prefer you a little bit on the thicker side. Oh, it's the same on the other end, right? Like they, they'll gain a little bit, but like in good places. And I'm like, yeah, you know, like a little <laughs> more slappable. It's like, whoa, you know, whoa, 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 guy. <laughs> a little tappy tap. Whoa, you know? Somebody had a good weekend. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying like, like things move and it's great. Like it, it's fun. Yeah. You know, it's like, fun. It's, 
<laughs> you know, you don't have to be all muscular it's and a lean good time. all the time, dude. Like, let's get a yeah. little soft. Yeah. Is that what you? Yeah. How do yeah. you? It, it depends how you say it, though. I know that you're you know, not like might hey, have been a little aggressive. You're not like, hey, babe, I like it when you're a little chunky. Yeah, yeah, you got to dance a little bit around it. You're yeah, like, like what like, do you say? Like, ooh, like yeah, you're getting very curvaceous. You know, like, <laughs> I don't know. That's now, probably not uh, what I use. Now, but. now that you know, Courtney's, uh, you know, stay at home now, is she uh, training more often? Or does she use your gym? Yeah. Does she go to the gym? Like, what does she? Does she? Train she's actually been on a massive kick with that, and and it's been good because she's like, uh, and I talked about this on my IG story a little bit that uh, I. She she basically did like a soft uh, breakup with her workout partner that she was working out with a lot and doing all these like cardio circuits and all this kind of stuff and she's been really consistently doing like uh, like maps aesthetic and 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 using whatever we have at our house and I've been working out with her too like maybe twice a week mm -hmm. so like but she's she's been on it and also we we just started throwing in the 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 hip thrusts you know because I have uh -oh. like a secret agenda with that obviously I've been <laughs> we had Brett Contreras on here he showed me that book of all his success stories and I'm like yeah you're not doing these. You know? <laughs> let's, uh, let's throw this in the mix on top of everything else. So yeah, I'm 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 curious to see uh, you know that development. That's one of Katrina's favorite. If you ever catch her working out in here, she's almost yeah. always doing that. She's hitting that up. Well, it's yeah. a great exercise. It's just like I always don't think of it, you know, because I'm always like so squat focused. Yeah, yeah it bring it does bring up a good point though that in in pictures versus real life, what looks good in real life is different oftentimes than what looks good in mm -hmm. pictures. Like. When you see someone who's like shredded in a picture, like, wow, that looks really cool. When you meet them in person, it doesn't typically look that good. It doesn't look that healthy. Like I've been shredded. My face looks gaunt. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. besides my abs and all that stuff, it doesn't look that that good. I think in reality, in real life, people pr pr prefer other people that are still healthy in the healthy fat range, but in the little bit heavier healthy fat range than the super shredded you know, healthy fat range. What do you, you know think I mean? that is? Do you think it's because we want something that we we identify more closely with? You think that's why? Well, I think it's evolutionary, dude. I think <clears throat> if, if look a man that's walking around at sub ten percent body okay, fat okay, all I mean, the time, probably less fertile. His, yeah. his, his hormones probably are less balanced. Hungry. Yeah, he's, he's, he, you know, it's a sign that he maybe doesn't have as many resources um, versus a man that's to say fifteen percent body fat, which is still healthy and still you know, considered relatively lean. It's just not, you don't have a six pack. You've got kind of the, you don't have a big beer belly, um, but you don't have a six pack. Same thing with women, like a woman who's too lean, probably not fertile. And so it's that biological evolutionary thing that you, you look at someone and it's like, yeah, you know, yeah, you're shredded, but it doesn't look as good. You ever look at like, go back. Do you think it's that, what, but what, I think it's more like we, we feel like they, they look like us, but a little bit better version of us. Therefore, I I want to hang because think about the same sex. I'm not att attracted to the to men, but then if not I not always right, yeah, there was that one true. time, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Besides that time, yeah, this count. You know, I I, I think. Uh, do you really think it's always evolutionary? I don't think that's why the same sex is hanging out with other people of the same sex that, that feel that way too. Like yeah. you don't look at a, a girlfriend and say, oh, she looks good with an extra 10 or 15 pounds on her when you're not thinking about reproducing with her. Mm. Oh, you, you mean like your friends? Yeah, yeah, that's what oh, I'm saying. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think it's just, I think we. it's more we... I've never really thought of that. I've I think never it's, really hung out with a dude because, he, or not hung out with like, <laughs> yeah. no, yeah, I'm not going to hang out with you. You avoid shredded guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I don't it's, know how to cool it. I think so. it's more yeah. subconscious. I think it's just like you you tend sure. to hang out with others you 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 look and feel you're like, but then there's a party that like them or that you're like, oh wow, they're a little more fit. I want to obtain that or be like yeah. that. Anything that's ad extreme, it makes is like well, uh, when, when they do this, they do the surveys on. For, so for women, when they do the surveys on whether or not they would they prefer a, what they call a dad bod versus shredded, like it's a majority. It's an actually it's a large majority of women prefer the, you know, quote unquote dad bod. Then when it comes for men, you know, when they do studies on what men find visually attractive, it's about hip to waist ratio. And that is a huge, there's a huge range. You could be 50 pounds heavier, have a good hip to waist ratio. Yeah. And a man is going to consider, or men will generally consider you physically attractive. You could be a lot smaller and have a good hip to waist ratio. And, the, and they found that throughout the world, that there's that ratio is consistent, so it's got to be evolutionary. It's got to be, mm. even though some cultures consider people, you know, to be smaller to be more attractive, or bigger to be more attractive. But look at like the last. They should base all this off of porn searches. 
<laughs> Whoa. <laughs> yeah. You know, like what people Actually, are really attracted point. to. That's because someone, it's weird. Dude, yeah, it's I there. feel like someone had morning sex this morning. Yeah. It's, 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 <laughs> don't no. fucking lie, guy. No, man. Uh, no. <laughs> I'd be glowing. Yeah. <laughs> I am not glowing. Okay. I got bags under the eyes. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. But, but yeah, no, but he actually makes a good point because porn, although porn, I don't think is, uh, I think it's the extreme. You know, well, yeah. Of that. Yeah. But then you find the somewhere in the middle based off the extreme. Like realistic. But yeah. But I mean, it. I, I just think that it's, I mean, we come up with these standards just because we're trying to create the standards, but it's just like people are so, you know, varied across the board of what they're interested in, you, you know, know, and like what they find attractive. At the end of the day, it's uh, what is healthy is in real life healthy. That, that's is what the, matters. That's yeah. the most attractive thing. Right. It just really is when someone has you know, physical signs of real balanced health, generally speaking, they're going to be considered more attractive to more people. Now, I will say this, unhealthy people tend to find unhealthy people attractive. Mm. So if you're like super body obsessed, yeah. you're probably going to be attracted to the more extreme, you know, body image type stuff. You know what I mean? Like, no, I only like women who or are- Or they're just staying in their lane. Yeah, yeah. Or, or whatever. Right. <laughs> You'll probably connect with other people that have the similar insecurities as you have. Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, Absolutely. I, we see that. Anyway, did you see uh, Kanye West? Uh, yes. Looks like he's collaborating with-, with Joel Osteen? No, but well, besides that. That uh, too, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, he did, a, he did a service thing or whatever at his- Well, uh, yeah, I saw him. He's getting, uh, you know, crucified, no pun intended, with uh, for that. I see everybody just- you know, it's so him. it's it's we're we we're, it's an interesting time right now. Like it it really is like uh, open season if you're a Christian man. I tell you what, they people they actually should, you make a good point. They they will you, if he if he came out and was said he was about some other Muslim religion, or said he was Buddhist or he said he was almost any other thing. It's I very in, it's very what's the word politically incorrect to say things yeah, against that man. But if I, you're Christian, it's the opposite. It's yeah, it's it's a uh, it's unfortunate that you see that. I mean, I even noticed that with. Uh, you know, you did a post on your uh, Instagram of after Bishop Barron, you know, great interview too. I thought that was, uh, you know, he's always one of my favorite people to talk to. And, you know, there's always a, a handful of people that are just triggered by that. Uh, just, just the, just the notion that we interviewed. And I, the irony is that I, I don't think any of them even fucking listen to it. Yeah. And, yeah. The, and then they get on there and they comment on your page uh, about how repulsed they are by it or how Dude, cringeworthy it is. And I'm just like, I tell you what, you're missing. If you're, I don't care what you believe in. I really don't. Um, as long as you don't hurt anybody um, and you're a good person, I don't give a shit what you believe in. But you're really doing yourself a disservice by being closed-minded and not seeing if you can gain any kind of wisdom from other beliefs. I don't mean you don't have to adopt everything that the other belief is all about, but if there's millions of people following something or saying something has value, the odds are that there's probably something you could take from it. And I, I feel like a lot of people, they're so, like you said, Adam, so triggered and so uh, you know anti that they won't even open up and say, okay, fine, I might not believe all of this, but there's some stuff that I may gain some... And spiritual leaders, uh, I don't, re regardless of the religion or, or the you know practice, oftentimes have a lot of you know very applicable wisdom. Whether you're mm -hmm. an atheist, agnostic, uh, or you know Christian, Muslim, whatever, there's a lot of wisdom there. So it's sad to see that because even even back when I was a hardcore atheist, I would still at least be open minded enough to look and say, okay, what is the wisdom that you can find in some of these practices? Like, why do they? Like, why would they fast or why do they practice abstinence in certain situations or why do they preach, you know, silence or, you know, what is what is spiritual value um, and what does that mean? And I think you can find that regardless of your, you know, you, there's there's wisdom there. Like, don't be so closed minded and pissed well, off. I, I just think that there's there's wisdom and value in diving into anything that you feel so strongly opposed to. Oh, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. So if, if there's something that I just believe to be true with all, whether no matter what side I'm talking about that I'm on, uh, and, and I believe it to be the truth the most, I think there, and I, I know there's some stoic quote around this, but you know, diving into the things that we believe to be true is probably the the areas that, and challenging that I think is probably one of the most important things growing as an individual that you can do. So. If you're repulsed by something or you think it's cringeworthy just because the thought of it or somebody mentioning something, that I mean, if that was me, that would make me really dive into that and unpack that. Like, what makes me so appalled by somebody else presenting something like this, especially when it's something that... 
like, like that? Like that's a yeah. po- positive? Like I think there's, there's this weird notion that like it's going to deter us from progress, right? Like it's, it's ancient practices and it's ancient ways of thinking and therefore we need to abandon, you know, whatever sort of, you know, like wisdom lied in, you know, old ways of thinking and really adopt these new concepts and create these new concepts, which, is, which let's see how that's been working out for us so far. Not so great. Well, so it's, it's arrogant. It's, it's extreme arrogance to, to because it's, it's as if we're considering people from thousands of years ago as entirely stupid, entirely ignorant. Now, there may be things that they were ignorant about, and there may be things that they were not privy to, um, but there are things, there, there is wisdom in, in people from thousands of years ago, too, especially if it's a practice that's... La- See, here's the deal. So, scientists, uh, science, scientists are people who support science believe in evolution, which they should, right? There's so much evidence to support that. But there isn't... It's not just biological evolution. It's one thing we have to understand about evolution. Yes, biology evolves, um, and, and the way that things evolve biologically is the things that work best tend to stick around, and mm-hmm. things that don't work tends to- Those traits get passed on. Tends to go away. So the best things tend to you know continue to, to pass through, and that's what happens. So what exists today is probably better suited uh, than, what exi- than what maybe existed you know 10,000 years ago or whatever, just because of the evolutionary process. Well, customs and behaviors also pass through- an evolutionary process. So if, if there's things that we consider outdated and we're like, ah, oh, fuck it, throw it all away, stop for a second, pause, um, look at it and say, okay, well, why does this exist? Why do humans live this way for thousands of years and believe in certain things for thousands of years? These beliefs evolved because they work, or at least some of it works. That doesn't mean we shouldn't examine things and we shouldn't look at things and say, okay, maybe this doesn't work anymore. Totally fine. Mm -hmm. But the idea that you throw it all away, you're being very arrogant. It's a very, very arrogant way of living and you're going to hurt yourself that way or cause a lot of problems. Especially when you've only been on this earth for 40 or 50 years. Yeah, it's it's, it's just, (laughs) or or younger, you know? It's crazy to me. But anyway, he's, uh, Kanye is uh, is collaborating with Dr. Dre, dude. Oh, shit. On a second album. There's a powerful duo right there. Really? I I can't. Have they ever worked together? I don't think so. That's I'm pretty sure because Kanye has been able to like basically construct his own beats and and you know put put everything together himself, produce wow. it himself. So. I'm su- now, are they announcing what the album is going to be? Titled? Jesus is King Two. Oh no shit! Yeah, they're doing part two of the of the Jesus is King album. Oh no shit! Yeah, now Kanye is releasing a Jesus is Born album on Christmas, which is separate. But then he's going to do part two of the one he just dropped with Dr. Dre. That is going to be that's going to be one of the biggest collaborations. Now, what do you what, ever what are your thoughts on the uh, the people? There's a, there's a large portion of the population right now that are just like, oh, Kanye is taking advantage of you know it's an opportunity to make a lot of money. You know what's funny about that? I, so part of me is like, oh, I could see that. I can hundred hundred percent understand yeah, if he where was this comes totally from. Totally cashing in on that. But here's the other part of me. Let's reverse for a second. Now it's easy to say that because Kanye's album hit number one and is crushing. Let's go back five years. Let's go back three years. If if I if if an artist were to say, you know what I think I'm going to do, I'm going to come out with a Christian album. Right, and you're <laughs> yeah. Everybody yeah. be like, you're an idiot. Yeah. You're not going to make but, any fucking money. Uh, to yeah. the point where most people that are are actually still go in the secular section because they yeah, know like that it's suicide. It your is. career. That's right. So I don't think he did it for money. I think he made money because it's good music. It's a good album, and the guy's obviously a genius when it comes to music. But I don't think I don't think he was thinking. Hmm, what's going to make me a lot of money? I'm going to come out with a Christian album. Yeah, that is not a way to make money. He, and he's kind of always been like the ultimate contrarian. Like even with fashion and different things like that, where you know he'll he'll spot something that like people might like. Total, there's no way they'd rock it. Like, and he'll he'll do it. You yeah. know, and he's just he has that kind of. Uh, you know, he he he'll just put himself out there like that, and he's always had. No, that. contrarian is a great word for him. I think that's yeah. great. His, he's been doing uh, uh, these like free, whatever you want to call them, concerts or performances um, at churches, and people are paying to come watch them. All the money is getting donated to charities. That's fantastic. And then he recently did uh, a surprise concert at a I forgot what prison it was, but he showed up and did this for uh, a bunch of inmates. And led a prayer with all of them, whatever. It seems to me seems genuine. Now here's a deal. He's Kanye's got one of the biggest egos of all time. So I don't and I don't know the guy, but it yeah. seems interesting to me. 
No, I, at the very least. Exactly. And the fact that he's working with Dr. Dre, that's like two of the most brilliant uh, people in music yeah. that I can think of. Like two, that's in, the, be, in the hip hop community for sure. Oh, just period. I yeah. mean, can you think of two, uh, uh, another collaboration that sounds more? No, no. Well, no. it's, that's yeah, cool. you, you just see what an impact it's, it's making on the, on the culture. You know, it's, it's, it's very interesting to watch, you know, how like the, the, the swing is starting to come back in a different direction. Now, do we know the release date when it's supposed to no. potentially? No, just no, right I now don't. we know they're collaborating. Yeah. It was like a picture of them together. You know, we're working on the next album, or whatever. So it's gonna wow, be kind of interesting. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, I was uh, um, reading up on. You guys saw Organifi's new product, Move. Yeah. So yeah, I've been using it. Now yeah. it's uh, it's it's replacing completely their their turmeric line, right? Yes. Okay. Um, but it's got other stuff in there. It's got pine bark uh, extract in there. It's got holy basil in there. It's got holy basil. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waiting to say. <laughs> it's got. <laughs> I saw that on there, and I'm like immediately in my head. Dude. Astaxanthin is in there. Great so, transition from a yeah, the, the, the holy talk. He loves it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so pine bark is really interesting. Pipe uh, pycnogenol is one of the active ingredients in pine bark. Now, I was very happy to see that they put this in their product. Pycnogenol is one of those other rare things out there that actually legit boosts nitric oxide. Uh, in fact, I used to take it back in the day as part of a pre-workout uh, regime that I would do. It actually legitimately works for that. It's got uh, great effects for asthma and inflammation. So, mm. uh, And this is, this is actually proven in some studies. So if you take pine bark extract before allergy season – the your instance of getting allergies goes down significantly. And really? Then, yes. And then there was another study that showed that we were just talking about ADD or ADHD early in the episode that pine bark extract has a positive effect on boys with ADD and ADHD. So that's just one of the ingredients. That's, oh, that's, that's interesting. That's, yeah, and I like I like that they they you know put that in there, but. Um, now it reminded of, me about that supplement. I haven't taken it for a long now, time. Now the bulk of it, I'm assuming, is is turmeric. So I mean, that, would, that would guess that's the large. It's base. got a pretty good uh, um, mix. It's got 300 milligrams of the turmeric uh, extract. It's got 100 milligrams of arctic pine, which is a, okay. a decent dose. It's got uh, six milligrams of astaxanthin, and then holy basil is at 100 milligrams, and that's just for. For one serving, so now, this is a legit, legit uh, product. Now that was so, you mentioned something that um, I didn't learn until later on uh, how much that could benefit me is when my when allergy season kicks around uh, kicks up is uh, understanding uh, how you you are systemically inflamed from that mm -hmm. right and taking things like turmeric or supplements like that and or uh, in in conjunction staying away from inflammatory foods. How much that can impact how bad your allergies feel. Mm -hmm. I notice a huge difference. In fact, I try and like those are days like I like to intermittent fast. You talk about different ways to, uh, you know, intermittently throw in fasting. One of my ways of doing that also is that's again, a great idea. Is when I know that uh, it's really bad allergy, like that week, or it's going to be bad. Uh, that's another great time for me to throw something like fasting or include things like turmeric or supplements like that in, in my diet. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, I, I noticed it, I've started practicing that just a few years ago and mm -hmm. it makes a, a big difference. Now it's hard to say because I don't know exactly how I would feel that day, but I've had allergies long enough and know when a, when a bad day is coming, the symptoms that I get and how, how uh, debilitating it can feel. And so me fasting and and throwing in things like turmeric and stuff into my diet around those times totally helps. Well, dude, along those lines of uh, of diet, um, this just came out on the 15th of, of November. This is from Yale University. A bit shocking. It's, it's a, a, not in a bad way, just interesting. I didn't realize that diet could have this much of an effect on um, influenza. So we're in the middle of flu season, right? Yeah. This is when... People start getting, and by the way, the Kaiser's flu has been calling me. Uh, have they coming for your shot? Are oh, they doing that? No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, by the way, the flu has killed. I was doing um, reading on just influenza, and boy, that influenza has killed so many people. It's absolutely at one point it killed like one out of every three people. Wow. You know, in the in the world, it's insane, and and it's just a it's scary virus. And even even if it doesn't kill you, it just makes it feel like complete shit. Well, believe it or not, how you eat can actually maybe um, help your body fight the flu. Um, so they found in this study that a ketogenic diet, believe it or not, um, reduced the, the, the rate at which mice got infected with the flu. And the ones who did get the flu hmm. were able to fight it off better 
because they were on a keto diet. And in this study, they talk about how the keto diet activates a subset of T cells in the lungs that kind of that are associated with your immune system's response to influenza, enhancing mucus production from airway cells that effectively will trap the virus. So they think that's one of the reasons why it works. Wow, interesting. So the so keto diet, your mucus. Yeah. So the, so the keto diet uh, in at least the study with mice. It was a great diet for the flu. Mm -hmm. That's good to know for somebody who's afraid of getting like really bad flu. Or now, whatever. is it totally. is it the uh, the higher amounts of fat and the reduction of carbohydrates? Is it uh, the caloric difference? You think because like could you think I could get the same benefits from potentially like fasting? What do you? That, that's a good question. Well, fasting probably right because fasting will can kick your body into ketosis. I think it was the ketosis that did it. Mm. Okay, because it was it was specifically a ketogenic. Uh, diet that they fed the mice, but how fun, how crazy is that, right? No, yeah. But this is also like this is what I really like to like when when stuff like this comes out. This is the stuff I like to share with like clients and and how to use uh, a lot of these different tools like intermittent fasting and the ketogenic diet. Like you know, unfortunately, they get popular because of fat loss and muscle building, and you know we focus so much on that, but. What a, what a great way to use tools like this for seasons. Yeah, or medicinally. Medicine. Yeah, yes. It's a medicine. Yeah, and now think about it, right? Think about it. When would would humans be more likely to eat a diet that is closer Winter. to- Exactly. Yeah. Because plants are not easily accessible. You're probably going to survive off of meat mm -hmm. and fat. Fat sources. And yeah. so you're, you're, you're going to be in it. So it's almost like your body, it's like a, a natural part of that, uh, your body's ability to fight a virus that tends to pop up during the winter season. So you seasons. think that in combination too with like feeling the onset of like feeling like a little bit depressed and down, like jumping in the sauna is having like uh, benefits to that too, getting your core temperature. Oh up. yeah. The yeah. sauna is another one. I mean, it stimulate it simulates like a fever and it probably strengthens you. There's now the, the sauna has got way more studies supporting it um, in terms of, uh, you know, helping Staving your immune off system. viruses. And, yeah. yeah. That kind of stuff. Yeah. That's, there's some, there's some really interesting research on, on uh, what do they call uh, what is it temperature contrast yeah contrast uh, therapy which would be like uh, you know cold dip or um, going in a sauna um, also along those lines of diet right so there's you know the, you know there's been a lot of controversy around you know game changers and veganism and this and that and I've been you yeah, know people are still bringing it up I know it's like ugh. It's so funny anyway so I've been reading all these articles and uh, and, and stuff and. This is interesting to me. So now this is this is not controversial, okay? But if we were hunter gatherers, uh, going vegan would kill you. That's a, that's not a um, probably kill you. This is not a, a controversial statement. It's a fact. Modern life has afforded us the ability to go vegan if we want to because we can have a wide variety of readily available it's year round, now. yeah, high you know calorically dense or nutrient dense vegetables and plants that we can combine. But in nature, without agriculture, without all that stuff, you, you're walking around. You just wouldn't get enough calories uh, by deciding to walk upon a, a you know a field of whatever. So then I read something else that was interesting. I did not know this. Did you know that wild almonds are, for the most part, deadly? Do you guys know that? Really? Wild almonds. Yes. So uh, today, this is even true today, consuming even 50 wild almonds could potentially kill an adult. What? Yes. So we've farmed almonds to become uh, not bitter and to become sweet and to have low or no levels of uh, you know deadly what they would what would even consider deadly poisons. For example, um, wild almonds will have a little bit of cyanide um, in them. What? Wow. And we've actually yes. So over time. Farmers like basic arsenic with uh, arsenic. Uh, sorry, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. yep, yep. Okay, yep. So I know apples have that. Same yeah. Property. So over time, farmers have d domesticated almond trees to produce these sweet seeds. Um, but through like crossbreeding over so many years, is that yeah? What it, we just bred them that way. breeding, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know how many people had to die on the way to that. But the but the wild I know, right? The, <laughs> oh, you crossbreed uh, this one. That didn't work. <laughs> but why? I mean, we've done that with a lot of plants where yeah. we've we've turned them into you know being able to uh, produce um, you know to to more of the fruit something that we can yeah. eat. Right. Yeah. Look at that. Bitter almonds may yield four to nine milligrams of hydrogen cyanide per almond and contain forty two times higher amounts of cyanide wow. than the trace levels found in sweet almonds. Interest eating such almonds could result in vertigo and other other typical bitter almond poisoning effects. 
Isn't that crazy? So yeah. When, well, where do you? I mean, where would you even find like a wild almond tree? That's you know, wild. it's like I, I don't even think about it because my my mom actually grew up on an almond ranch and uh, like, almond or almond. Yes, you call them almonds. Yeah. What is an almond? Really annoying. I don't know. Like that's like apparently that's what they call like like almonds. They call them almonds in in for some reason. Like they just want to be cool. Mm. Yeah. Is this where you developed your your like your your passion for? Skinny dipped almonds or almonds in general. <laughs> it's probably it's, it's I could probably trace it back. It's in it's in my DNA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it's a re- really drawn to almonds. But isn't that weird? So so here you are. You're out in the wild. You're like hey, I'm going to survive off of plants. Oh my god, look a wild <laughs> almond tree. Oh, you, this is safe. Yeah. How did John Not die? So safe. What yeah. the fuck happened to John? Well, I didn't he even, ate those almonds. I didn't even realize that there was two yeah, cyanide. Uh, that's crazy. A sweet and a bitter type. Like mm-hmm. I've I don't think I've ever had a bitter almond before. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. I know, right? Yeah, you and your random studies. <laughs> yeah, I love so it. Great. Isn't that cool? Well, here's another one uh, on diet. This is an, another interesting study on diet. I'm going to bring it up because I don't want to misrepresent yeah. it. But this one's really fascinating. Um, oh, here we go. So this was published uh, November 18th, 2009, uh, 2019 from Brigham and Women's Hospital. So investigators found that eating a healthy diet may reduce the risk of acquiring hearing loss, believe it or not. What? So eating a healthy diet, they've now connected to a slower loss in hearing as you age. Hmm. So not only does a healthy diet you know, keep you leaner, good for heart health, reduce cancer risk, but other stuff like hearing loss. Like if you eat a healthy diet, you're less likely to have that the hearing loss. What's that's the associated mechanism? With How does that affect hearing? Uh, well, this is what they theorize. They theorize things like, like long chain fatty, you know, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, other types of uh, nutrients like beta carotene, uh, uh, carotenoids. Um, just the fact that healthy foods just are healthier and have nutrients or contain nutrients that are better for your body. What, a nice, what a nice tra- transition from the almonds because you can find that in almonds, right? What? The the omega th- your omegas you can also just the healthy fat yeah omegas are I mean uh, almonds are very healthy yeah food it's probably one of the best one of the healthiest uh, snacks you should, should have. tell uh, skinny dip it could be a new tagline <laughs> eat your almonds don't go deaf right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah keep your hearing <laughs> yeah. I don't know if they'll want to do that <laughs> oh, wow. so you guys know that the Airbnb has been under some bit of fire recently in terms of like whatever the like shooting tax dotting oh no, they they shooting that, that, yeah, that too, shooting right? not that long ago well, so they're everything? making a they're, they're making a, a push right now to spawn Sponsor the Olympics, the next five Olympics for five hundred million. What? Yeah, and and I think this is like a big public kind of like like trying to like help their their the look of the brand and everything and um it, what they're doing too, which is kind of interesting with this is is providing uh, opportunities for some of the athletes to to kind of cash in on experiences through like uh, like renting through Airbnb and so they they plan like if it's somebody that's that's running uh, an event like they're planning like like run with me through the city. Or uh-huh. like learn boxing with so and so, and like all this, uh, you know, tied into the Airbnb they're staying at, and they have like all these like pop ups with these athletes, which is interesting because it's also think about how much money like these athletes aren't getting paid anything until after they're done, maybe if they're lucky and they're po- that popular with with sponsors, they don't make anything. I'm just I'm fascinated by the, their their business model. Period. I when we started shopping around for properties and stuff like that, and we were looking at Airbnb, I, I started kind of digging around like their business model and I didn't realize like uh, how much money somebody can make as just like a what they call a host and you can uh, in what a cool part-time gig or if you're a stay-at-home mom it's a you know very uh, uber-esque type of model where you know I can sign up for this and I can be a host for you know wherever I live in my area mm. pick like 10 homes that are rented out and, and so you, you go let people in and kind of yeah. keep, keep tabs oh, like a manager on the yeah, you're like and, yeah. and, and it's funny after I read that it made sense cuz we've stayed at so many Airbnbs and VRBOs with traveling with Mind Pump and we've had this before where you know remember when we were at the Hollywood house and they had like one of those crazy uh, remotes that turn on the sauna, the TV, they control everything and we couldn't figure it out and yeah. somebody shows up to the house. They're not the owner of the house, but they're like a hostess. They're, that's kind of their job is to make sure that people like us that come and rent the property have a pleasant experience. We don't get locked out, yada, yada, yada. But you can st- you can do that as like a little side gig and they they get paid decent, I think. Dude, so yeah. Airbnb yeah, smart. is got to scare the shit out of these hotels and these big... They've got to be shaking in their boots because 100%. I mean I don't think it'll kill them. I think there's always going to be a place for the hotel experience, but for sure they're dipping into their pockets. Hundred percent. 
It's got to be frightening. Mm -hmm. So I I have an old client and who's a friend of mine who their family is in the hotel business. And so one of the things that she's, in fact, we were just talking about this last week, she's looking into doing and what they're trying to do to pivot and handle this is creating more of a unique experience um, at the hotel. So being more like these smaller you know, 50 to 100 room hotels that create more of a Airbnb, Airbnb type of experience or just a unique experience in itself, whether it be like entertainment that's in there, or it's kind of got like a swanky lounge in there, but attracting people to the hotel for other reasons than just staying there in the nice rooms hmm. is uh, where they're going to have to pivot to. And so I think we're going to see the, the hotels that do survive We'll we'll probably start seeing more of these kind of boutique s type of hotels so pop cool. up. I know. I think it's, I love this sharing economy. I really love it. I, my yeah. my cousins live in the city. None of them own a car. When they want to rent a car, they don't go through the big car rental agencies. There's there's apps, and they literally will go up to some dude's or woman's you know garage or parking spot or whatever. Grab and they're, they're, the app on the phone opens the car. They get in there. And they drive away. And I think so, that one is crazy to me. Yeah. I mean, That's so, such a wild one. So it's like if you own a car and you live in the city, and you're not going to drive it that often. Why not rent it? When It's just sharing economy. And what this is doing is it's, it's, a, it's giving everyday people access or more everyday people access to luxury items or expensive items. Like, you know, before, imagine trying to rent a big old mansion, how much it would cost or a big old house. Through Airbnb, you're just saving money if you count the rooms and all the people you can fit in there. I think it's neat what the the job opportunities that it's creating for people. Oh, it's huge. Yeah. I mean, imagine being a, a teenage kid now. Like you for sure would be doing Uber and DoorDash and like on the as a side hustle. Like what a cool thing that you can uh, how many how many cool jobs can you right when you start basically dictate your schedule mm-hmm. and work as much as you want to work to me. I mean, that's pretty rad. Great. If you're if you were a college student and you need to make some money and you know all these jobs are saying, "Oh, we need you 9 to 5 or mm-hmm. the shift from 4 to 8." And you're like, "Oh, I have this class and oh, but what I can do is I can Uber or DoorDash between those 2 hours, mm-hmm. shut it down, go back to school and then come back 3 hours later, work 1 hour like and still and make a little bit of money. Like that's really cool to me." All right, first question is from KCI and Wojo. Can you go deeper into what a deload week looks like? how to incorporate it into your programming and the purpose and benefits of doing so. Now, before we do that, deload. I, I'd like to hear your guys' opinion on how important do you think this is for the majority? Like how many people like really need a deload week? Do you think uh, when you think about all of your yeah. clients that you've trained and the average person that's going well, to consistency the- is always the biggest uh, uh, you know hurdle for clients to well, begin with. So. Well, yeah, the value, I mean, see that's a tough question because when I would train a client, I would go based off of their feedback when I, and I'd know when I need to train them easier or lighter, or lower the intensity, that type of which is essentially what a deload week is. It's you're, what you're doing with the deload week is you're reducing the intensity, uh, among other things. That's the main thing of the workouts, but you're continually you're still working out now. Why? The big question is why why is a deload week better than just not doing anything? Like if I need to rest, why don't I do anything? Why don't I just sit around and do nothing? Or why don't I just be active? You can just be active and that that's better than doing nothing. But the the value of doing a deload week is that you're you're allowing your body to rest but you're still training the movements. You see, you want to practice movements mm-hmm. consistently but to give your body the ability or you know the, the the capability to recover and adapt and you think well why is it important to continue practicing the movement because the, you 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 you're you hone lo- in on that signal yeah and you lose your ability to do the movement exceptionally well when you stop even for a week so it's like practicing you know throwing a football maybe you don't throw it as hard but you still practice throwing it cuz you want right. to always remember that skill always keep it uh you know cemented into your into your brain so that's one of the big values of, of an actual structured deload week. The other value is moving, even if when you reduce the intensity, moving actually facilitates recovery better than not moving at all. Yeah, I, I think like it, when I think of a, a, a structured deload week and when and how to do it, uh, I typically think of, like, for example, um, I'm running Maps Powerlift right now. And the way the program is designed is like week over week. I am scaling volume, mm-hmm. adding, 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 adding. Now, I, I'm guessing that towards the end of this program, 
I will have definitely I'll definitely be stretching myself and have a pretty and and I'm also pushing heavier weight, heavier weight, heavier weight, and including and increasing overall volume. So there's a good chance that after I, I finish the program, it'd be ideal to probably you know scale back on the intensity and or volume for about a week, but like you said, still practice. Now the other way that uh, I think I've used uh, you know deloading for clients is actually more for the client who is they are attracted to the high intensity training like the orange theories and the you know those circuit based type of uh, classes that are high intensity for an hour and they've been doing that consistently and they have a ton of stress uh, throughout their day because of work they they work long hours and they they're they have a very important job and responsible for a lot of things or a lot of stuff going on with their family and they're just getting an overload of stress and that could that can happen and build up in a matter of just a week. They don't have to necessarily be have consistently been lifting for, you know, months on months of scaling volume. They could just be throwing a lot at the body all at one time, stress wise. And as a trainer, I could see that and feel that from the feedback that they're giving mm -hmm. me when I'm talking to them to, to Sal's point. And so then I would do like a quote unquote deload week with them and say, Hey, you know, let's do this. Let's scale back on some of the the intense training that we're doing. Let's do uh, straight sets with longer rest periods. Let's maybe take uh, that that fourth or fifth day off in the gym. I want you to replace it with something like yoga or just go for a nice walk or hike that day. And so as a trainer, that that's kind of how I've I think I would say I use deloading on on the the average client because you know, not a lot of people are training like some of our power lifter friends or somebody who is or a, a bodybuilder. You know, if you're one of those people, I, I would say, you know, programming a, a deload weekend, knowing that you're scaling up, scaling up, scaling up week over week, week over week, consistent, not missing. That makes more sense. Yeah, I think it definitely uh, depends on the time length of training. Like I don't I don't really anticipate a deload week with a beginner that we're trying to establish like the routine and and we're progressively overloading continuously from, you know, a baseline where it, you know, we this is where we're starting from and we need to uh, you know, increase your skill set. We need to get adapted towards, you know, how you respond to to lifting weights in, in this direction. And we can always alter, you know, the, the weight based off an intent I'm going to play with that, but I'm I'm still trying to scale you up to a point where you're like self sufficient and like your body is pretty well adapted to weight training. And then after that, you know, now we intensify it further. We get into like the like intermediate to to advanced, and and we're you know you're doing like a powerlifting program, and you are like really stretching yourself. Like that's where I feel like a good deload week will will tell you, man. Uh, yeah, we need to we need to now uh, like recover. Yeah, if we tend to think of working out because training exercise has a lot of different um, values but the main one that we tend to focus on is on its ability to force your body uh, to adapt um, you're breaking things down you're pushing your body you're stressing your body getting it to adapt and that's definitely one of the values of exercise but exercise can also be restorative which is different Restorative exercise isn't aiming to break the body down. It's not aiming to force the body to adapt. Restorative exercise is literally, like the word says, helping you restore your own natural abilities, helping you feel better and recover. Um, I've been through you know, periods of my life where stress was very, very high. During those periods of time, I was not working out in the gym trying to push my body to build muscle or get stronger. I was going to the gym to keep myself healthy, to keep things feeling good, to help alleviate stress, not to add stress. Because exercise, when you're pushing your body to adapt, you're actually adding stress on your body. Not a bad thing when you do it right, by the way, but that is what you're doing. But if your stress is always is already at a, at a top level, your body's already having trouble um, adapting to the stress that's being placed upon it, sometimes you want to do something, and you exercise is a good way to do this, you throw something on it that helps your body deal with with the stress, which is restorative. And that's what a deload week is supposed to be. When you go into a deload week, it's an easier week of exercise meant to have restorative effects on the body, not meant to push your body to adapt like your other workouts did. And wouldn't you say that, that that's probably the most common thing, right? I just feel like, and no one knows this answer better than you who's listening. You know, what 
Is it been a, a crazy week for you? Have you been, you know, burning the candle at both ends at work and you've got family stress going on? And then on top of that, you've got this personal fitness goal you've been, you know, cracking away at every week over week and you've been consistent with, you know, learning to to be a, become aware of that yourself and knowing that, hey, maybe this week of my workouts is not going to look crazy intense. Maybe this week's workouts are, I'm going to practice the skill of moving better or doing things like yoga and more mobility and stretching type work. You know, you, you, you have to learn to do it. And as trainers and coaches, I mean, it was our job to try and to, to read that by asking the right questions from clients. Like, Hey, how was your work? How was sleep last night? Yeah, you can tell sometime once you've been training for some, you know, someone yeah, for right, a couple bags of years, under their eyes, yeah, like, they'd walk in the gym and I'd look at them and be like, yeah, today's going to be a restorative. Yep you know, deload workout. So, but now here's the deal. It's hard. This is a process of learning yourself because here's what happens. Some people will be like, I don't know when I need a deload week because sometimes when I'm really stressed and tired, going into a really hard workout makes me feel better. And so they're kind of misreading the signals. In which case I would say this, um, it's probably a good idea to, to schedule deload weeks when you're just learning how to read your body. Or if you have a history of overdoing it. If you're the kind of person that just either ignores the, the signals willfully or you're just not able to read them very well, structure in your workout a deload week. And typically, you know, for some people, it's once every four weeks, once every six weeks, maybe once every nine weeks where you have a, a week that's in your schedule and you know, no matter how you feel, I'm going to go to the gym and that whole week is going to be a deload week. That whole week's going to be easier. That whole week's going to be focused on on restore, you know, restorative type exercise, even regardless of how I feel. And if you do it that way, if you structure it that way, you may prevent ever having to do it or forcing, you know, needing to be in that position in the first place. Well, and when you go that route, try and uh, uh, connect the dots with the other aspects of your life besides your performance goals in the gym, right? So obviously when you're deloading, you're not going to see you know, bench press go up. You're not going to see you get the most shredded you've ever had or see major progress. Look at the other things in your life, uh, your your sleep. How is that going? Your energy levels throughout the day, any sort of cravings you may or may not have. Uh, pay attention to your performance at work. Like think about the, the benefits that you're getting uh, overall health from that deload week. And sometimes we get so myopic about uh, oh, I, this is my fitness goal, yeah. and you know, oh, hey, how's this deload week gonna, you know, you know, serve my, you know, big fitness goal that I have? And then you go, oh man, I took that week off, and I didn't get stronger, or I didn't get leaner. That's okay. That's those aren't the only things that you should be paying attention to. Pay attention to the other aspects of your life and how that deload week serves you, and then you just learn to kind of do it yeah. more, more on the fly. Here's a good sign that a deload week was was what you needed. When you come back and you have better workouts. Yeah. When you come back after a deload week and you're like, whoa, I feel good, man. I feel strong. I feel yeah. less pain or whatever. Then you know like, okay, that was, that was something that, that I was needed. needed. Next question is from Tiffy Leap. How does one develop side glutes? I have a weird concave between my leg and hip instead of the side glutes being round. Side butt. Ooh, I did yeah. a YouTube video on this. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Build yeah. that side butt. What did you do in the vi in the video? We should link that in the show notes. By yeah. The way. Uh, I'm trying to write. So I think I did uh, lateral uh, tube walks. I did um, sumo deadlift. Um, squats. Uh, yeah, I didn't. I'm not, not really a big curtsy stuff, lunge yeah. guy, but I, I mean, that that is something that you could definitely do. I don't remember all the stuff I did in there, but honestly, actually, uh, the sumo deadlift is one of my favorite things to teach to somebody trying to do that, just because of the mm -hmm. you know. But, but you got to push out while yeah, you're lifting. Yeah, you yeah. got to you got to know that um, that's what that's responsible for, and this is actually really common. Uh, a lot of people uh, that the the side butt uh, or side glute. Uh, becomes really uh, dormant because we don't do a lot of things laterally or you know moving in different planes as we get older and so we just we we lose that good connection there and so then when you do an exercise like squats or hip thrusts or some of these traditional movements that should develop the entire butt that part of the glute is is kind of and I, I hate saying turned off cuz it's not completely turned off it's less dominant and you're not getting a lot of extra help like you should from there and knowing to open up your knees or push your knees out, mm -hmm. uh, which is why it, it's really popular. Um, so I actually just I did another YouTube video that will go live. It's not live yet on the um, the hip circle. Yeah, hip the hips. Thank you. Yeah, the, the add hip. that to hip thrust. Yeah. So yeah, uh, the hip circle. This is what what's great about using the hip thrust or the the hip circle 
for things like the hip thrust, deadlifting, and squatting is that because the band is pushing your knees in, you have to fight against the band and push the knees out. That's your side butt that does that. Mm -hmm. So it, you, it forces you to turn that on while you do a movement like squatting, like deadlifting, or like hip thrusting. So this is where this tool is a really uh, beneficial tool to help somebody engage that part of their butt while they're doing these traditional movements. But like I talk about in this upcoming YouTube video, it's a tool, use it that way to get reconnected to that area and utilize it, but learn to do it without the band so you don't have to use a band yeah. forever. Yeah, the side butt's referring to, so when you look at the, the glute complex, it's like the, the butt, the whole butt cheek, right? There's, there's actually more than just one muscle. There's three. There, you have the gluteus maximus, which is the big meat part of the butt. And then on the side, you have the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus which are kind of sit on the top side of the butt and then one that's right on the side of the butt. And they're actually small muscles. And they they have, you know, they stabilize the glutes. They they actually they stabilize the gluteus maximus. They help when you squat and do leg thru uh, hip thrusts and lunges. Um, but they also bring the leg out uh, in what's called abduction or lateral. So if you're standing, if you, you're confused with the words I'm using here, if you're standing up and you just bring your leg out to the side, like you're going to do a karate kick mm. while keeping your foot pointing straight, you're activating, among other things, those those muscles on the side uh, of your glutes. So exercises that work on that function help work those muscles. Now, we'll say this. They're small muscles. So if you are if you go to the gym, you're like, you know what? I want to work on my side butt, so I'm not going to do any more hip thrusts. I'm not going to do it's any an more squats. I'm going to do all the abduction machine, you know, dog a.k.a. Dog peas. Yeah, dog peas, the good girl, bad girl machine, all that stuff. Yeah, side karate kicks. You'll actually lose uh, size and, and, and roundness and firmness to your glutes because you're going to sacrifice working the big meaty part of the glute for the smaller part. So what Adam's talking about is just being able to feel them when you're doing the big exercises. So one way you could do it, now a hip circle is basically a band. So you can either buy a hip circle or you can get yourself a resistance band and tie it around your legs. This is what I used to do with my clients. This is before uh, I knew hip circles existed. I would take a resistance band, put it around my client's knees, and tell them, all right, push your knees apart while squatting. That way we could activate those muscles and you can kind of feel them a little bit. It's not making it necessarily making the squat more effective for those muscles. It's making you feel those muscles more so that when you do your squats, they do become more effective for those uh, for those areas. So that's kind of one way you could do it. Abduction machines or abduction in general, like tube walking, that's another way to do it. One thing I recommend is this. If you have a weakness or a weak area or part of your body, train that first. Yeah. Then go to all your big movements. So uh, this is one of the few times where I'll tell someone to do a small movement before they do their big squats and, lun and, and lunges and thrusts. Go ahead and do your tube walking. Go ahead and do your abduction machine. Do your exercises that kind of activate those muscles. Then go do your barbell squats and your hip thrusts. But, but stay mindful of those area, of that area that you're trying to feel and work on. And do it before every single leg workout. You know, we call it priming, right? Before every leg workout, do that uh, to, to target those areas. And then watch what happens to your – this is one of the things I love about resistance training. It's mm -hmm. like a sculptor. Right. So it's the only form of exercise where you could specifically target parts of your body and sculpt it as you see fit, of course, with limitations. And this is one way to do it. Next question is from Joyful JJ. I have hypermobile hip joints that have led me to have terrible recruitment patterns in my lower body. I try to strengthen the muscles around my hips, but I still feel like I'm not able to engage them correctly. What can I do to fix this? This yep. is this is an, uh, another what a great who picked this? That was a good question. I did. So the uh kudos to you. This is normally like a Justin question because yeah. Justin is big uh isometric guy. And slow training. Yep. And I, this is a great, great uh way to uh incorporate mm -hmm. isometrics and I think why it's such a underrated tool in in our space. So um, I would definitely incorporate some of that. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Oh, totally. I remember the first time I had a client who was actually hypermobile. And the reason why I remember it is because it's way less common than a person who's tight. Mm -hmm. Like the average person is tight. So yeah. when I was a trainer, when I first became a trainer, I'd get clients and almost every single one of them, I had to work on improving their mobility, their range of motion, getting them to be able to squat deeper you know, loosening up their hamstrings and their hip flexors and their hips and their shoulders. And then I remember I got this one client that, and I didn't know that this was a problem because I was a new trainer. So I had this one client, I did my assessment and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you're super flexible. 
this is going to be easy. It's right. going to be great. Like you, yeah. like you could, you could fold your body in half. You could like do their the form looks perfect. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So you could totally move and everything. And then we would train and everything would hurt. Yeah. And, and I'd be like, well, this is very strange. Why is everything hurting? And luckily, I, I had a, another uh, friend of mine who was a trainer who was also a physical therapist, and they explained to me that uh, you know having the extreme ranges of motion without strength is just as bad. It causes instability. Mm -hmm. And so the way I train this person, this is the way I always approach this because I've had, since then, I've had several clients who've, who are hypermobile, is it, it's very different than the way I train other people. So other people, I'm constantly challenging range of motion. I'm constantly trying to get them to be able to squat deeper. Of course, everything with good form and all that stuff. With a person like this, I stop them yeah. from full range of motion. Mm -hmm. So when I have someone like this, we're not squatting ass to grass. I'm stopping them a little bit, I'm letting them go past parallel just a little bit. Mm. Pause there, hold the squat, come up real slow. Now go back down, stop, and I would have to tell them where to stop the rep. I would not let their flexibility mm -hmm. determine where to stop the rep. We'd have to go lighter, and we'd have to keep lots and lots of tension and go slow. And then over time, we would build stability in their body, but it's a it's a very different stability approach. training yeah. too. Yeah. yeah, like someone like this that's in their hips, I, I think right away like single leg toe touches is such a great move for that person, and you don't need to do it uh, holding very much weight whatsoever. And it's you know back to what Sal uh, and I know what Justin will go to or towards, which is the isometric stuff is. You know, you move them all the way down. You get them to that point that you want to stop them at. And in that point, you have them hold like an isometric pose there for a second, maybe five seconds, mm -hmm. and then come back out of the rep and then move back down and, and just work on stability and isometric together, you know? Yeah, it's it's a totally different way of approaching um, reps too. So like there's going to be less reps because it's very taxing when you're trying to irradiate this, this muscular tension throughout your body and just basically meaning like you're squeezing all these muscles and really trying to feel your way through where, uh, you know, you may have a loss in terms of like I can drop into that position, but I'm not necessarily, you know, tight and strong in that position. Um, so I would work and one of these techniques that w why I was really drawn to like the stick mobility guys and what they're doing with adding in isometric components to it. Um, there was a way to add, and we did a video on this a long time ago we called the Dumphy squat, but the, the concept there was really to then, uh, add, add more muscular tension, even with the upper body getting involved in squatting. And so this, this was a way to push up and and create you actually feel like your muscles get that tension get tight and that kind of cascading down into the hips and so as you slowly lower you could just feel this resistance through your body so i'm going down real slow i'm feeling that resistance and that tightness if i feel at all there's a loss in that tightness i'm going to stop right there mm. and then we're going to squeeze like you said we're, we're going to go ahead and hold like for that five second hold um to try and reestablish that that connectivity there like there's 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 a drop and, and that's where the instability, uh, you know, that's a problem uh, to where if I'm in this and I can't get out of it with strength, uh, that's an issue. What a great video you just referenced that should definitely be linked in the show notes, for, especially for this person. For someone who's got hypermobile hips, uh, the Dumphy squat would be fantastic. So I can always tell a, a client because they, uh, especially with squatting in their hypermobile is a their uh, their legs kind of flop everywhere when they drop. They can drop all the way down, ass to grass, but the knees are wobbly all over, in and out of the squat. And you could tell even if their form looks good. When you watch somebody who's hypermobile, even if everything looks kind of perfect, you can tell that they're that they're they're losing tension the whole time. Mm -hmm. You could just see them move through the squat, and it's as if they're not tight and tense. So so this is the thing: do your exercises. Don't let your body tell you how deep to go with the movements. Stop just a little bit before. You know you could go any deeper, and then stay tight with everything. And then here's here's the good news for people who are hypermobile: you start building muscle. It's really a great solution. You put you yeah. pack muscle on somebody's hypermobile, and they really start to solve a lot of the problems. Uh, yeah, and uh, Joe just reminded me and Joe DeFranco cert like they're talking about. You either need to mobilize or stabilize. So this would be like on that 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 side of needing to stabilize. All right. Next question is from Kyler Carpenter. What's the most memorable client that you have ever had? Oh boy, you know I, I've I've trained. Mm. I have a few that pop up to mind uh, immediately. I've trained a lot of people. Right? I've trained I don't know probably one on one, a hundred or more, and then through proxy thousands, right? Meaning through trainers that have worked for me or, or in gyms that I've managed. 
But there's a few that pop up. The the ones that I think about immediately are the ones that became trainers themselves. So mm. uh, one lady I trained, uh, Nicole, um, she was actually the first client that I got when I started my personal training studio. Um, my very, very first studio was in the back of a tanning salon. I rented a space in the back. She was in there. She was on cardio, doing cardio. I, my very first day of having the, 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 the place, I walked up to her, introduced myself. Um, she hired me. She'd never worked with a trainer before. And then we became, you know, I trained her for a little longer after that. And she got so interested in, in fitness that she became a trainer and then was a trainer in my uh, facility. So that's why that was so memorable to me. Um, another kid, um, uh, Colin, he was actually here for the Joe DeFranco certification. Oh, yeah, I trained I his him. parents, yeah. uh, Martin and Annette. I trained them for years. He was like, I want to say six or seven when I started training them. So they would bring him in, and he was this cute little kid. Uh, you know, he'd come in and hang out or whatever, and I'd you know hang out with him, play with him. Then as he got a little older, his mom and dad hired me to train him. How crazy know, to see him in here for a certification. And, 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 and now a he's, he's became a trainer, and now he's in here, um, you know, getting a certification. And so that's you know super mobile, uh, super memorable, I should say. Um, Carol, she's the longest client that I ever trained. Carol was uh, you know older when I first started training her. She's got to be now in her late seventies, but I trained her for thirteen. I want to say thirteen years. Every Monday at 3 p.m., every Monday at 3 p.m., I trained her for 13 years. And she ne almost never, the only time we missed workouts was, was when, when I canceled because I had to go on vacation or something like that. Um, and, you know, she had a big picture of me in her house and people thought, you know, that was her son. They'd come in and be like, you know, oh, that's a nice picture. And she said, oh, that's, that's just my trainer, Sal. Oh, whatever. that's great. <laughs> yeah. Was, that's when you know you've made it as a trainer, right? When you make the, the uh, mantle. Yeah. It was, <laughs> she was, it, it was really hard to, yeah. to tell her I wasn't going to train anymore. I picture we, like a big uh, picture, like the Kramer, the big Kramer <laughs> picture above the fire of Sal. <laughs> you walk in the house, this big yeah. ass fucking Kramer. I got you. <laughs> yeah. so, like, pointing at you. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it was really hard to tell her that um, I wasn't going to train her anymore when Mind Pump was started growing and we all, you know, I sold my facility or whatever, and I remember telling her. She knew too. She's like, "Well, I knew this would happen, you know, one day or whatever." And yeah. it was, it was like so hard to say that, you know, say bye to her that way or whatever. <laughs> so, and then I've got the clients who lost lots of weight and you know, and, and all that stuff. You only but, get one. Yeah, so. I was gonna say yeah, he's like yeah. on seven right, right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I feel, I feel like I'm all of them are there, dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've had a lot of like it really impactful clients, and it's yeah, it's it's really hard to reduce it down to one. I mean, I do still occasionally like I'll train, uh, you know, this client of mine because she has made such a massive impact on my life in, in all kinds of different ways, business wise, um, just overall the character that she exudes as a human being is just like admirable. Um, the kind the type of, uh, network she has is, is like unreal in terms of like ex presidents and, uh, you know, people amongst, uh, the, the top tier, uh, companies out there, like, uh, you know, worked side by side with Steve jobs. And, um, like I was training her in like sessions where there was a conference call with just her and Steve Jobs. I had to be super silent and not, you know, say anything she probably uh, said, outside of that. She's yeah. probably like, don't tell anybody, Justin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm like, and now I told everybody, she doesn't work there anymore. Sorry, so okay. it's like, yeah. it's all good. And he's it's passed away. Game. I think you're okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not revealing anything anybody doesn't know. But uh, yeah, no, it was crazy. Like it was just... The, to watch like that lifestyle was just I, I didn't I couldn't understand how she was able to manage all these things and be a good person and be you know have this uh, like philanthropy and like trying to make uh, an impact in the world for the better and and so anyways I just admire the hell out of her uh, and uh, you know and she she reveres me the same in terms of being able to be a, a, a you know an integral component to like managing her health and, and my knowledge that I've acquired over the years, like she's benefited from. And like, we go back and forth all the time about what's the newest, latest, uh, you know, out there for me. And it's always something like, it's always another key that we just unlocked, which is like this, the coolest thing ever. Like I'm, she's like this, this massive puzzle of like the, the most high demanding stress that, that impacts your body and, and sleep and everything. And to be able to apply one new thing, like, you know, every time I learn something and and it benefits her life for the better has been like super impactful. Uh, it's, it is really hard to, to nail down like one uh, memorable client because I think so many clients are extremely memorable for me 
a lot of them uh, have played huge roles in developing developing me as a trainer, develop me as a just a human being, and make me a better businessman. Like there's so many things that. I think I, I have gotten from from many clients that I have helped with their health and fitness journey. Uh, the one that comes to mind though that I haven't shared on this podcast uh, before uh, was a client uh, named Tracy that I got about, I don't know, I would say eight to 10 years into my career as a, as a personal trainer. And I remember when I, I took her on as a client, I was I was already managing team. So I, I didn't, once I became a, a manager where I was overseeing personal trainers, I was uh, obviously training a lot less clients and developing trainers for most of the time. And I'd always have, you know, five or 10 clients that I loved training that I, I kept, uh, that I would still be servicing. But I, I remember kind of like checking myself on, you know, it's been quite a few years now where I haven't taken on a hard client. Like I have, I've been taking clients that I liked training and that I enjoyed selfishly. And, you know, and I had told myself, you know, the next real hard challenge that comes across my table, um, I, I want to take. And, and it just happened to be this girl. And, and what made me pick her up as a client, because normally I would meet someone like this and I would uh, delegate out to one of my trainers or match her up was uh, she had her sports medicine degree. So I knew she was uh, educated in, in my field. Uh, she was an, an ex-athlete. So she'd been in, so she had the, the discipline, the motivation. She was playing uh, softball at the time and was pretty active. Uh, and she was a nurse working uh, long hours. And uh, on top of that, she had basically battled with obesity her entire life. And uh, couldn't solve it, just couldn't figure it out, couldn't. Uh, and she was uh, probably 80 to 120 pounds or so overweight. So she was, you know, reaching that, you know, biggest loser type status. It was around that time, too, when that show was so popular. And she was looking for help. And I knew that, okay, this is going to be a challenge. Like this was, this is going to stretch me as, as a trainer. And this is actually the beginning of me really learning the importance and we asked we answered a question on the last qual about um you know taking starting everybody on a bulk right or in in reverse dieting basically everybody up into her i didn't think that way if i got a client normally like her it would be cut her calories move her more but here i have a person who's on her feet moving all day long she's an ex-athlete so she's got the intensity side to her she's got the sports medicine degree so she understands nutrition and exercise pretty damn well. And she's extremely overweight. And so, holy shit, where do I start this person? And so it really made me uh, dive into being a better trainer. And uh, this is when uh, I I had to start applying these, these, these principles of taking someone on like that and kind of deloading, you know, talking about that in the last question and going, okay, how do I reduce stress in this person, improve sleep in this person, uh, reverse diet them out to speed their metabolism up, and then get her to the, these goals? So she was quite the project for me. Um, and I would say she's most memorable for a few reasons. Uh, I think it, she uh, took me to another level as a, as a coach and a trainer. I think uh, I, I evolved through our relationship. And she also later on became a, a close uh, friend and advocate of mine. I, I still... Uh, stay in touch with her and uh, re consider her a, a good friend now. And we ended up losing. I think she dropped 80 pounds uh, with me over the course of a few years that we trained together. But um, that was a really challenging client. And because of that, uh, it's the, the first one that stands out uh, when we when we talk about most memorable clients. I'd have to say that's the biggest value of, uh, of personal training, if you do it right, is you get training back Yep. You know what I mean? It's like uh, selfishly, you know, you, you you learn a lot from these people. So. Oh, yeah. No, taught me so much. Um, and if it w if she wasn't challenging and hard, because you, you could real easily become a trainer who just gravitates to the clients that you do well with and you, yeah. uh, you know, you have the answers for them. And so you kind of, you build your whole business around this demographic, which is common in our space. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of friends and peers, I People think. People get comfortable. Yeah. That they, and, and they, and they, they forget sometimes that they're speaking to the, 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 their majority or their population of people they always help. And, you know, I knew that this was going to stretch my capacity as a trainer it wasn't the type of client that I, I normally gravitated towards or I had a lot of success in and I knew I wanted to, to stretch myself and 
Uh, she did. She taught me a lot about myself and as a coach and, and as a leader, as a trainer, and um, I'm forever grateful for that relationship. Excellent. Go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our free resources. We have guides on everything from fat loss to muscle building to specific body part training. We have guides on guides. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at mindpumpjustin. You can find me at mindpumpsal, and you can find Adam at mindpumpadam.